Hello and welcome to Unparliamentary Language, a podcast that thinks it's been nearly three months since our last episode. That is a disgrace. Is that about the right timbre for that for that joke, Rob? It, it's very good. It got my pork markets very excited. Pork markets? <laughs> if anyone follows us on Twitter, Donna derailed this podcast straight from the start, but uh, I just tweeted that out uh, when <laughs> we get to part one. Uh, I mean, we're just going to go straight in, no headlines. Uh, Rob and I have caught up in the Patreon bonus episode and in person recently, so go there if you want. We're just going to pile straight on in because there's a lot to get through. And number one is the Tory leadership contest. So, Rob, why are we saying pork markets at each other? Um, it's because when, when you last left us, we were waving Boris Johnson goodbye and considering we didn't know who was actually running for Tory leadership or who would be the final runners and riders. And over the summer, in what was possibly the longest Tory leadership election that I ever remember. It seemed to go on for ages. Um, we slowly went It was all summer, wasn't up. it? It was all summer, yeah. Um, which was sort of... Uh, the reason they ran it like that, I guess, was they, they thought that, oh, it was... When Boris went, Parliament was about to break up for the summer recess anyway. So why not hold the contest over the summer recess? Then when we're back, we can announce the Prime Minister and get on with it and pretend like nothing's happened. We would have been on holiday anyway. Um, however, one of the reasons it felt so long is because before Parliament broke up, we had the MPs section of the leadership contest. So that's when you tried to get to the final two by Tory MPs voting on who they want. And the one who gets the least votes is eliminated or some of them when they realise that they'll never get the amount of MPs on their side to try and get them over the finish line. They pull out the contest anyway. Uh, so we had various runners and riders. I think maybe a few just to pick up on was uh, Kenny Banadot was an interesting candidate, former equalities minister. She looked like she had momentum at one point and then fell out in about like the fourth round. Um, you had Tom Tugendhat, who was one of the more moderate conservatives. However, I felt that his vote was cannibalised by Rishi Sunak, who seemed to have most of the other moderate conservatives with him. Then it was kind of the fight for the right of the party, which was between Banadot, Liz Truss and Penny Mordaunt. Um, for a while, Penny Mordaunt seemed to be the front running candidate on the right. She was the one who was getting all of the front page news. However, it appeared that she was just a front runner because nobody knew anything about her. And as soon as the spotlight was on her, people t got spooked and they went back to the more experienced um, or, or who they perceived to be the more experienced candidate the one who had more cabinet experience, and that was Liz Truss. Yeah, so we end up with our final two, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak. And from the beginning, you've got this really weird feeling that the papers seem to think Liz Truss has this in the bag, right? From about the week one of the contest, for some reason, that the Conservative membership, which is sort of the ones that read the Telegraph, the Mail and the Express, those papers are all saying, you should back Liz Truss for leader. Uh, and that momentum carries on through the summer. So that's one of the reasons I think it was one of the longer contests, because it felt like it was done and dusted. But we had to wait an awfully long time to see actual results. There seemed to be a hustings on the BBC or on Sky or on GB News. And they had a, vari a wide variety of them where they came out and seemed to be. <laughs> it was kind of a, a race to the right of the party, in my view, where Liz Truss clearly had the support amongst the members and Rishi Sunak, seeing that she probably had the lead, tried to bring in more and more sort of like slightly right wing policies into his a group of ideas to try and get a few more people across. Uh, that didn't work. And in the end, we ended up with Liz Truss winning the contest with about 80,000 votes in total, with a by a margin of about 57 point something percent to Rishi Sunak's 42 point something percent. So a, a sizable victory. We're not talking about, you know, 52-48, the eternal figure in British politics. Um, but yeah, not not a complete landslide, as some have predicted. Um, but when I say that figure, 80,000 Tory members had voted for the leader of the Conservative Party and therefore our Prime Minister. That's something that is controversial Anyway, when you're talking about their role in a democracy, um, my favorite, one of my favorite politicians I follow on Twitter, Count Binface, uh, he pointed out that in the London mayoral elections, uh, he'd got uh, around about 90,000 votes. So that just puts it in a little bit of context for you that 
it does seem to be a very small amount of people within our within our nation who are choosing the next leader of the country. And boy, that can go one of two ways, which we will discuss tonight. So yeah, that's a very, very quick rundown of the Tory leadership contest. Have you got anything to you'd like to add or any of your experiences over the summer? Uh, not not really. I think it was just kind of a bit like watching a train crash happen in slow motion where <laughs> At some point, it was very clear. I mean, anyone who wants to can go into the archives of Newscast and listen to them talking about it. But I think it became very clear quite quickly that Liz Truss was going to win when it was down to the two of them. And obviously, Rishi Sunak had to keep, you know, going. Like, he can lose face by just stepping down at that point. Um, But yeah, we were just kind of stuck in this weird month and a bit where we knew Liz Truss was probably going to win. And that's what everything told us. And we just had to kind of be like, I mean, it helped prepare us, I guess, a bit. But as we're going to get on to in the rest of this episode, maybe, maybe didn't prepare us enough. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was uh, it wasn't a great summer. It was kind of nice in some ways, I guess, that less politics was happening for a bit because I felt like I didn't need to pay as much attention. I think I got as much out of all their hustings and stuff from just seeing the clips and stuff that got shared. Um I guess the only thing worth noting is that because there are a lot of clips of them saying things, um, there was a lot of saying the quiet stuff out loud on national TV, uh, which means that Labour is going to have a very easy job of just pulling out quotes of both. Well, I mean, Sunak, they don't need to so much, but like both of them saying kind of pretty atrocious stuff over the summer. Um, You know, various things came out like uh, money being taken away from uh, deprived neighbourhoods to go to like the, you know, posh people in in Tunbridge Wells, things like that. There is a whole load of stuff. And I can't believe that was only like a month and a half ago um, because a lot has happened in the last (laughs) few weeks. So yeah, it's, it's, they say a week is a long time in politics. Uh, Feel feels like this summer doubly so, but um, yeah, I don't really have much to add. Um, We didn't, I mean, I think I said at the start, I can't remember if that was on our episode or maybe just in one of our pre chats where, I felt like she was possibly the worst option of every of all the candidates we knew about at the time that may have missed a few. Like, you know, there there are some quite extreme candidates who were never going to go anywhere. But I just felt like she, you know, this is this is like Boris Johnson all over again. We all thought Boris Johnson was a bit useless, but he obviously at least had, you know, the political guile to be a politician and had, you know, been London. Met. Like there are some things he had seemingly done well. And even if that kind of all unraveled when he was in office. I can't remember Liz Truss doing anything particularly useful for her entire like that there is a she's been around for a fair amount of time keeps being put in positions where she doesn't do a lot doesn't know a lot about the job um and so it feels like we've just swapped uh, one useless leader for another really yes i think it was it it's bizarre that the transformation of Liz Truss that happened during that conservative leadership campaign where for some reason she was being portrayed as the new margaret thatcher like in one of the debates she literally wore the same as thatcher did um which led to some people on twitter saying that she was just cosplaying as thatcher and they it appeared that she was the candidate that had been picked by the writers ah you've got a lot of experience So people will believe you're good, but we're going to press our views onto you. These might not necessarily be views that you've held in the past, because as we might discuss in the future, but she was she campaigned for Remain, right? She was one of the arch Remainers back in that uh, back in the uh, referendum back in 2016, and now she's coming up with some incredibly Brexity stuff. Um, to back up her pitch for Conservative leader. So for me, it always felt a little, it didn't feel genuine. It didn't feel like we were seeing the real Liz Truss. We were seeing a, the will of a, of, of a wing of the Conservative Party sort of thrust upon her. And she was like, yeah, I'll, I'll be this mouthpiece if it, if it means I get to be Prime Minister. So yes, very odd indeed. But that's who we've ended up with. I know, I know we often talk about politicians obviously just wanting power above all else. We've, we've, probably beaten that horse to death with uh, the discussion about Boris Johnson. But, um, what, you know, as someone who's been able to change in order to get what she wants and get into power and eventually become prime minister, uh, go and search the various clips of Liz Truss at a Liberal Democrat party conference uh, back in the 90s. So, you know, she's gone from Liberal Democrat to Conservative and she's gone from, as you say, uh, Remainer to Brexiteer. She's gone from anti-monarchy to pro-monarchy, uh, it would seem. Uh, which we might touch on a bit in one of our later stories. Um, but yeah, uh, obviously someone who is willing to pretty much say whatever she wants to get power. Yeah, I would 
Uh, I would say that's a, a fairly accurate representation. We'll, uh, we'll maybe dive in a little bit more later to see what she does with the power. We can't have Liz Truss coming into power without someone vacating that spot. Uh, we've mentioned his name a number of times already. Uh, so Bojo left. Was that with fanfare? Was it kind of a, a damp squib? What, what happened there? It, it was odd. Maybe this is on me for not wanting to pay very much attention to Boris Johnson's farewell tour. But it did seem that the country at large was done with Boris Johnson or saw him as a political irrelevance by the time it was time for him to go, um, which sort of cements his odd decision to have this protracted leadership contest and him bubbling on in the background as a lame duck PM. Like there usually is a transition period, a, a period of power, which you know, has to go on in the background. But when Theresa May did it, she sort of resigned quickly and allowed the competition to go on quickly because she said, we've got to get Brexit done. We need this deadlock broken in Parliament. I'll allow Boris Johnson to take over quite quickly. At least that's how I remember it. Head. Um, this Boris Johnson farewell tour kind of bubbled on over the summer. He wore a flak jacket. He participated in a drug raid. He uh, did a few exercises with the military. He called his best mate Zelensky in Ukraine a couple more times. It was, you know, like it was like make a wish, but for, for the prime minister. Um, <laughs> he was just sort of doing everything that he thought he should have been able to do over the, uh, the remainder of his term, but he had to condense it all into six weeks. Um, that was quite odd, but. Yeah, we we finally got to the day he did his little leaving speech outside Downing Street, which, to nobody's surprise, he didn't really offer any contrition. And to some, he left a little hint that, you know, oh, I'm going now, but, you know, never say never, I might be back. Uh, And I just quickly wanted to put a point on that, that there does seem to be a, personally for me, there does seem to be a delusion amongst Boris Johnson and some Boris Johnson supporters that he has a fan base that would want him back. For me, I look at how toxic he became towards the end of the premiership, how his personal gaffes and crises ultimately led to his own demise. And I wonder if people, if the general public can forgive that. I mean, obviously, it depends on the quality of the follow-up act, and there are already some um, saying, oh, this wouldn't have happened under Boris. And I'll go into the reasons why I, I, I think they're correct in that assumption um, later on. But just because Boris wouldn't have done what Liz Truss done doesn't mean that he would be a good prime minister or it'd be good for him to make a return. So, yes, um, he left with a little fanfare, a touch of Boris and an odd speech to leave on. But as we said when we were talking about him last time, we were speaking about his other speech, he did sort of resignation speech in air quotes. It was um, not the most prime ministerial and it, yeah, it all had a touch of Boris about it. But I was glad that it was finally over and that we could get to sort of the next stage of British. Yeah, I mean, I think we needed to move on. I think the one thing I will add is that there was a bit of talk about, because Boris has been kind of likened to Trump in some ways as a populist prime minister who has broken a lot of conventions and rules. And so there was a lot of concern about this period over summer where he was going to be technically in power as a caretaker prime minister until um, we knew the outcome of the leadership election. And I think the only, you know, I feel we try and report things as unbiased as possible. Obviously, we have our own opinions on things. And I think, you know, both of us have agreed that Boris has not been great for the country and all sorts of other things. Uh, Not a very good prime minister. um, But he did kind of just sit there and not do anything. Like, I think there was a lot of concern that he was going to do something absolutely wild while he was still technically in power. But he did kind of just go... I've got this kind of half a cabinet. I've got a few people to agree to kind of stand in cabinet positions and and just kind of tick things over over the summer, which, you know, I guess that's one positive against a big list of negatives um, for Boris. He knew the game was up, didn't he? He knew he couldn't just perform the same old act and get away with it. He was in a very vulnerable position. I reckon if he tried to do that, they would have just cut him off. So. Yeah, I, I think I think so. I mean, I think when that much of your party is against you, even if you have a staunch group of followers who we might get to later, apparently, I think some of them were already putting in votes of no confidence against, uh, sorry, not votes, were already putting in letters of no confidence to the 1922 committee as soon as his successor was there, or so they claim on Twitter. Um, but yeah, I think they are a minority of the party as a whole. So for our next story, we have to quickly put up the black eye dents and uh, put on our black ties off screen uh, before coming on and looking very sternly at the camera and saying that uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has died. 
obviously we're not breaking that news uh this happened a while back um uh, as you know by the time this podcast is edited i imagine it's been a few weeks uh, we had a period of national mourning um which i think a lot of people were a bit confused about like there was stuff like our shop's going to be open um th- there's been a whole load of stuff going on I, obviously uh you know, the queen did her job for a very long time i don't i mean other than like my grandma who is going to be the same age as the queen this year so must be kept safe from Liz Truss at all costs um <laughs> the um you know i i don't there aren't many people i know who were alive before we had a queen there are a few like things that you see around where they still have like king on we still have like older post boxes and stuff but yeah the, the, it it's it is a big change for us as a country um it's not it's not surprising that a 96 year old woman has died as some some uh, outlets have put it and some people on twitter but uh, i think it was kind of interesting to see how we reacted as a nation like we we happen to know people who've been briefed on operation london bridge and stuff like that so we you know that's done the rounds in the papers i think everyone kind of knew what would happen in general um but it was still kind of weird to be just kind of transfixed to the tv when the royal family announced that the queen was ill which is a step above anything so normally it's like oh she's got a bit of a cold she'll be fine kind of thing and this is very much a she is unwell her doctors have told her to you know rest then it was just rolling coverage and at that point we kind of all knew i think there were a few people who were predicting stuff but it's like you know we, we don't know exactly in that period of time when she passed away we were told at 6 p.m i think most of us were watching the tv in some way or keeping an eye on bbc live news from like 1 p.m you know e- e- even people i know who have never cared for the monarchy or even the queen just like it, it's it's a, a big thing to happen you know um the last time i feel like we had this kind of interest in the same way was when princess diana died like i know that there were some jokes and stuff when prince philip died because like you know, stuff like radio one suddenly going from being in the middle of like a, a some piece of rap music to suddenly like oh no he's died uh was kind of, kind of done in an amusing way um and then but but yeah I, I think like that's the last time i remember something like this where the whole country was kind of like oh uh and it was just kind of weird i, I don't i don't know what your your plan for this segment is rob but it was just very odd wasn't it yeah it, it was odd and i think it, we can't not mention it like it's a huge moment in in history and the, the, the most striking thing was that it happened within she oversaw the transition of power between boris johnson and liz truss met them both in person as is protocol the next day it was read that she wasn't going to be able to perform her sort of privy council duties. And then the day after that, she passed away. So you found, yeah, Liz Truss, Prime Minister for two days, suddenly has the responsibility of addressing the nation, being the one to deliver a reading at the funeral, to be that figurehead. If it happened a week earlier, it would have been Boris Johnson, which might have been quite bizarre, knowing that that Prime Minister is on the way out, but he still has to perform those duties. You had people like Penny Mordaunt, who was, you know, up until that moment, hadn't held a high cabinet position. She was given a random position where it's like, oh, by the way, if the Queen dies, then you'll be overseeing all of this. All of a sudden, that's in her intro on only a second day on the job. So I think just from like a political point of view, it's very interesting to see how they deal with that transition of power. What amazed me is it's sort of like how quick it was, you know, for the moment that Hugh Edwards said, the Queen is dead. You About two minutes later, he said, yeah, and, and by the way, Charles III is the new king. Um, so it's all, yeah, very quick, very, you know, organised. Clearly, these, like I said, these plans have been in place for years and years and years, and they know what they're doing. Um, and it's the end of the Elizabethan age after many, many years of rule. So, yeah, I just thought, you know, we had to mention it. If, if you're finding out that the Queen's dead for the first time on this podcast, I don't know where you've been, quite frankly. So I do hope that you're aware and this isn't just breaking news to you. Um, but yeah, certainly a, a historic moment and one unexpected challenge that Liz Truss had to face at the start of her premiership. And as we might go on to discuss, I think it's one that I don't know. Every every leader is expected to have sort of like a honeymoon period, right? Where they get, you know, Liz Truss would have been in the spotlight for that first week. In fact, it turned out that her first two weeks on the job were mostly taken up by state protocol and doing stuff around the Queen. So I don't know if that arrested her momentum somewhat to the things that we we're about to discuss or affected her public image a lot. So I would be be interested. I assume that the polling and all of that would have been quite neutral during that that morning period. 
Um, yes, just a very, a very odd thing to land on your desk a few days after you've become prime minister to deal with somebody who's been around for 76 years. And it's the great juxtaposition of our society, isn't it, that we have a monarch that can reign for so long. And at the moment, our prime ministers seem to reign for quite a short period of time. My reaction to this has mostly been documenting the weird um, because I've been in London there was a lot of odd things. So there's a load of stuff, like we said, with the BBC to do with protocol that we know that the BBC and other uh, broadcasters uh, have to follow. Um, I think it was notable that only Channel 5 was showing, uh, eight, wasn't showing the funeral on the day of the funeral, uh, for example. And I think they were watching, it wasn't B-movie, it was, it was something. It was the com- Emoji movie. The Emoji movie, yes, yes, that was it. I knew, I knew it was something um, that the internet loves to hate or hates to love. Yeah, I, I've kind of been like watching the weirdness. So I think, you know, as we found out, you know, there's been various stuff, you know, t- Twitter was a weird place to be like this kind of some some people you don't realize are very royalist or Republican coming out as one or the other and saying a thing. Brands were the weirdest. I mean, I think for a while, I think the weirdest was Crazy Frog saying R.I.P. Uh, Queen with like candle emoji. Ring, digga, ding, ding, ba, ba, ba. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I mean, we just mentally add that on whenever we hear Crazy Frog, <laughs> right? Um, and then uh, there were a number. I mean, there are some fake ones went around. I think probably my favorite fake one was the one where it looked like all of McDonald's touched water screens had got the Queen on. But then some things were really like that. So I went into London uh, the day after, and I was like, it feel like it felt odd. I mean, I, I tried explaining this to some colleagues. Um, some said they didn't feel that way necessarily, and I don't know if that's because they went out and about. But like, there, there was, like, I think just because something had changed in a way. You know, it was a bit like when we first heard about um coronavirus and you've got to stay indoors. I mean, obviously that had a more obvious change to all of us uh, where we were stuck inside. But I, I like it was kind of a similar thing where it's like, oh, something has changed and everything was different. And I got to Waterloo and I was like, oh weird i thought there'd be like a big thing saying you know the queen has died etc and i turned around and i i don't know how well you know waterloo station but there is this giant uh led advertising screen and it was just a picture of the queen with a load of national rail staff and it was and it, i mean a lot of these things were a lot of these things were kind of black and white some of these things were more tasteful well i'm sorry i'm not saying that black and white isn't tasteful some some of these things are a bit more colorful so this one was all the the, the railway workers in like their orange uh high vises and stuff with the queen in the middle of like some event and so you see that and then then you go down onto the tube and it is just every single advert on the tube had been replaced like if they were paper adverts they'd just been taken down and if they were the lcd screen adverts they had all been turned to a black and white picture of the queen saying remembering queen elizabeth with, with you know the dates and it was like that was weird. <laughs> so I and I was on the way to an event that at the weekend that was running, and because it's um you know loads loads of stuff running, like there was a question whether this event could even run because like guidance had to go out from scouting, being like you can still have an event, but you kind of like can't be super happy on social media during this time because it's a period of national mourning and all kind of considerations like that. So and then obviously suddenly half the world decided to descend on both London and Windsor. So any events going on near to, to like the palaces, we had to curtail because this was like a, a weekend away where people can pick what event they want to do. So some people, Legoland just closed. Like there was all sorts of things like that happening, which I think was kind of odd. Um, not necessarily unexpected, but just like having to watch all this happen is a bit strange because like it's upending normality. Um, and then I think like you said, you said King Charles III, very, very weird hearing that the first X number of times. I have slightly adjusted to that. The thing I'm now going through that is slightly weird is I've got to the part of my podcast queue where I'm hearing podcasts that were recorded, not like news podcasts, but just normal podcasts where it's casually mentioned. Or even, you know, you get the inserted adverts into um, podcasts uh, if they're on like a big network. And so, so yeah, the way they work is there's like a timestamp and they insert an advert there of a certain length. Um, and those are always quite funny if you use a VPN or you go abroad because you like get a weird Swedish advert. The one recently doing the rounds is advertising for for people to go work at his majesty's prisons and just hearing that in an advert casually it's just like my brain hasn't got used to that yet i've it, it's very strange all of those things changing over yeah like how all the barristers are now kc instead of qc and that happened the day after wasn't it and just little things like that which you just you've grown up with them haven't you they've just always been the the, the the queens like even we went to the cricket and they had a minute silence and then we sang the national anthem with the new lyrics and that's really weird because the national anthem to to you has always been unchanging right it's just this thing 
and it's just pronouns, I guess, at the end of the day. But you are, yeah, it, it just feels very odd that that can change just because of that one person. So, yeah, huge, huge impact in ways that you're not quite, you didn't really consider until it happened. It was very interesting. It does touch everybody, whether, yeah, you, 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 it was unavoidable, wasn't it, for that, for that period of time. A huge new story. And, and while we had to mention that, obviously, amongst all the weirdness, you know, you see people who've like, you know, like, like when we had the, uh, the Jubilee or Platy Jubes, as it got known on the internet. Um, and I only say that so I can set up saying that some people decided that this had to be referred to as statey fumes, um, which I've said out loud now. It's on. It's recorded <laughs> for all the people who absolutely hate that. It, it's there. Um, but yeah, um, you know, th there's all the weirdness around. You know, people like baking odd cakes and people choosing to mourn in particularly weird ways. You know, or, or, or like you say, like, like we said, some places closing when you're like, oh, maybe you should just have stayed open. You know. A lot of things going on. There was a whole load of discourse about whether supermarkets should be open and stuff. And all of that we don't have time to touch on. But I do think we need to touch on the queue, which may be the most British thing to ever happen. In fact, there's a Twitter thread that I'll put in the show notes of someone being like, you, you just can't believe, like, this is the thing we Brits have been training for all our lives. The biggest queue ever. And there was so what happened was the Queen was lying in state for, I think it was seven days in the end. Yes. So the Queen was initially lying in state up in Scotland because that's where she died and uh, Operation Unicorn came into effect, which is like a subset of Operation London Bridge. So she was uh, lying in state for a bit up in Edinburgh and then she got transported down to, to Westminster Abbey where she was then lying in state. Um, I, there's so much to go into <laughs> about the queue that everyone has touched on and I'm sure if you've been following the news, uh, like we're not going to have any particularly new takes Um but there is, I would, I would check out the uh, John Oliver uh, smash smash cut on uh, YouTube of like all the things to do with the queue from the news because it's just very odd, like seeing people talking about the queue and how very British it is, um, and we're just so good at queuing and all of this, and it, very odd. Uh, and I, I mean, just uh, there's a game now which I'll throw in the show, uh, show notes, which is a a real time queue simulator where you have to queue for twenty five hours in like a little eight bit game, uh, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, the fact that it was the queue, like in you know, the like the definite article, as it were, um, and the other thing is, uh, we had uh, one of our friends, a fellow podcaster on the network uh, of the Astrocast, Brad, go and be our queue correspondent. So uh, I'm just going to insert a clip now. So yeah, I'm just uh, recording this uh, as you've asked, um, just as we're walking along. Um, honestly, the mood in the queue is quite good. I think everyone seems to be quite good spirits um, I think everyone's kind of understand this is a frankly ridiculous thing to do to go traipsing through uh, London for 12 hours um, but yeah I think everyone seems it's, it's a nice, nice moment of national unity I think that's the phrase we, we've just used um, uh, why have I done this why have I you know, walked through London at a very slow pace um, partly it's a moment in history you know it's a something that's probably not going to come again um, and secondly uh, yeah, as you as you know Wilco I've been a scout for 20 20 odd years um, 22 years and I've you know I've been saying duty to God and to the Queen for most of that so all of that really so I kind of feel this is fulfilling the, the duty to the Queen part um, I'll throw some more recordings in as stuff occurs to me um, and I'll do one once I've been through the hall because that might be quite interesting um, oh we're coming to another zigzaggy queuey bit um, so I will speak to you in a bit Bye. hello Dr Tom and, um, and good old Rob um, so yeah this is this is me recording from the queue as, as asked and we're just going past the London Bridge uh, experience so there is a skeleton in a gibbet um it's been interesting. We're currently on our nearly hour four in the queue, um, and we're about halfway through the route. Hello, uh, Wilco and Rob. Um, so we've we've just got out um, of uh, Westminster Hall. Um, that was uh, beautiful. Um, the atmosphere inside the hall is intense. <laughs> um, 
it was heavy, hard, but I think we're both glad we did it. Um, yeah, um, quite emotional actually. Um, quite a bit more than I thought I probably would be. Um, yeah, it's been, it's, been, it's been a really long day. Um, our feet are incredibly sore. Um, yeah, we just need to get the uh, pick up our bags and, and head out of London. So, um, cool. Speak to you later. So there, there we go. Some live reporting from the queue. Thanks to Brad for doing that for us. Um, I, I fully understand the kind of desire to just experience that being a bit weird. I went and took photos of the queue. I didn't decide to join it because I couldn't like drop what I was doing work wise. I think Brad happened to be on holiday and passing by, so thought why not um so uh, yeah it's it, oh, just everything is so weird and i think we needed to touch on how the world was very weird for two weeks luckily now it's completely normal isn't it that's what we're yeah, yeah. Talking everything about. everything is 100 percent more um <laughs> what i was gonna say one of the things one of the upsides of having two weeks of enforced mourning and the government not being able to do a lot of things including uh, just one last weird thing i need to mention when you know the met office the weather service for the country was like we're not going to put out as many weather reports because of the period of national morning and and i we under like i understand that this is because all these national bodies have various rules they have to follow but it was very funny the idea that the weather would just stop for the queen <laughs> um yes. you know uh, it was that was probably one of my the, the weirder ones for me but um yeah the other thing obviously is the government didn't do much they had to do a load of stuff relating to the funeral which was you know Everyone went on about how we're so good at pomp and circumstance and all of this, and a load of like nearly all the national leaders came over except for like Putin for obvious reasons. Um, and it was it was a whole big deal, but importantly, it meant that Liz Truss and her chancellor could not touch the economy or any of the like levers of power for two weeks, which was quite nice. It turns out because our main headline tonight is a uh, mini, and you can't see me doing the uh, quotes around that, but a mini budget that went out on Friday. So, I mean, Rob, first off, what is a mini budget? So you have the budget with the Chancellor where he comes out with the big red briefcase. That is a standard point every time in the year. But the Chancellor at any point can say, hey, I'm, I'm updating economic policy a little bit. That's what our new Chancellor of the Exchequer, Kwasi Kwarteng, decided to do on Friday. And yeah, although it's called a mini budget, I would say there was nothing mini about it because it does represent one of the biggest shifts in UK economic policy that we've seen in yeah a, a very long time. And as we're about to discuss, when you shift things quite a lot, um, things can change quite a bit. And yeah, boy, have we seen its ripple effects happen over the past few days. Maybe I think it was a blessing that it happened on a Friday. We haven't really seen the full effects until Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of this week. Yeah, so just 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 to clarify the point of the mini budget, so that like you said, the budget's supposed to happen at the same time every year, and then you normally have a, a spring statement, is what we've got used to. Yeah. So yeah. you kind of get this every six months, um. But the actual date of the budget has moved around, and we've we've discussed that before, where chancellors have said, "Oh, we're going to move when uh the budget is, so that we can you know appear better in the press and stuff." And that's happened. Uh, I'm trying to remember now, but it was both um, it was under Cameron and then under under Rishi Sunak, right? It was. Obviously, Cameron Cameron wasn't Chancellor of the Exchequer, but you know, what I mean, it was it was um, George Osborne did it, and then and it's some it's sometimes to react to things like oh, we're coming out of lockdown, that means a significant change in our economic policy. It's right that we update our our policy now and convene that to the general public. So yeah, sometimes it's for a little popular boost. Other times it's like yeah, no, you you need to change tack now. And I, I would expect at this stage you have a new leader who was promised a new economic direction, they probably had to uh, do it at some point, but they cannot call it an official budget. The, the other thing to state is that one of the big things with the budget is that it has to be signed off by the uh, Office of Budget Responsibility, is that it, OBR? <laughs> yeah, yeah, OBR, yeah. So, so basically that means that the Chancellor has to submit those numbers to this uh, meant-to-be-independent uh, body that then checks the numbers. Um, and obviously with a mini-budget, such rules don't apply. So... Uh, maybe we need to go through what was announced in uh, the mini budget. First thing up, income tax cuts. What happened there? 
Uh, yeah, so I think this was the big headline figure that came out, at least the one that shocked people the most um, in, in some ways more than others. So Liz Truss had campaigned that she would lower taxes if she was going to become Conservative leader. And it was a big gripe of Conservative MPs and Conservative uh, members that taxes in the country were too high. We discussed when Rishi Sunak was Chancellor that even though he was a Conservative Chancellor, taxes were at their highest levels since the war, since World War II, which seemed like a very unconservative thing to do. Now, Rishi Sunak would come in and say, hey, I had to do that because we've got all this debt that we've built up from the furlough seam over coronavirus. We need to balance the national budget. Uh, Liz Truss took a different tack. So uh, the headline figure, I think, was that the um, 45% additional rate of income tax for those earning more than 150000 would be scrapped entirely and would be changed to a 40% higher rate on incomes of over 50000 a year. Commenting on that for a second, that is quite a controversial tax cut because it is unashamedly targeted at the richest 2% in our society. Mostly when governments have done tax cuts, they tend to say, right, we're going to do this on a staggered sale. So those at the bottom, those those hard workers, those honest, ordinary people, you'll benefit the most. And Rich, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you own a lot of money already, so you're going to have to take the brunt of these tax cuts. But hey ho. Listros and Kuateng turned that on its head and said, no, we think the rich should be uh, rewarded for their hard work and we're going to uh, abolish the 45% the rate of tax for you. So, yeah, that has been a bold economic move and one that they've, I think, have struggled to justify um, a little. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, I can see why they've, why they've done it or the strategy behind it okay so please explain to us rob because <laughs> okay I, I always i always preface these conversations when we do them all, like chance the stuff is that i'm not an economist so apologies if i get anything wrong but i think i know the broad science behind it or the broad theory behind it anyway which is um conservatives like to cut tax they don't like high tax because they think that money is best spent in the hands of you know if you earn that money you should choose how you spend it. And they believe it's a good it's good news when people who have a lot of money can spend more of it. Uh, it's called trickle-down economics. And some people, I think, might like the way that is portrayed with sort of champagne glasses all stacked on top of one another and little bits trickling out the side as they overflow down to people down beneath. That's not quite what we mean when we talk about trickle economics in a, in a theoretical sense. What they think is that if businesses or if rich people have more money to spend, they will reinvest that money in their own business. And that in turn will create more jobs for the economy. More jobs means more growth. And as a result, um, you will get more bang from your buck, even if you lower taxes, for example. Uh, I think I've done a sum somewhere in here, but I think the, the maths off the top of my head is that if you're taxing 45%, for every £100. Um, if you're able to cut tax and then the economy grows and you get £120 instead of £100, then if you tax that 40%, you'll actually get £48 back rather than 45 So you've you've made more money in tax and the people who, you know, and the people feel that they've got a they get to keep more of their money as well. So that's the theory behind it. Um, however, and it's a big but, and it's one of the reasons why not only do people think this is unfair, there's another reason why the markets or economists don't think this is a great idea. Uh, so we've got quite a lot of employment at the moment. Boris Johnson used to bang on about it at PMQs every time that we've got some of the highest employment figures that we've ever had in the country, right? Does that mean that our economy's doing well? Well, more people are at work, but does work actually pay for those people? Maybe not, particularly with inflation. And inflation is caused when you have lots of workers in the economy who demand higher wages and prices go up as a result. So actually, maybe putting more money in for more jobs isn't the best thing to do to stimulate your economy and make more people go to work. Um, the other problem that I see in this theory is that more money to create more jobs is great, right? But there's a lot of reasons why people don't go to work. Even if the jobs are there, you have other factors like, oh, 
that job is very far away and oil is too expensive. So I don't want to commute to that job. I have an underlying health condition, which has been unable to be sorted or resolved um, in a manner which allows me to go to work because my NHS is understaffed or underfunded. Um, oh, I can't go there because the infrastructure around me, my technology, my broadband isn't fast enough, so I can't work from home either. There are structural factors that prevent people from going to those jobs. And how do you pay for all those structural factors? With tax, by raising tax and the state helping to pay for those things, to help more people go into work. And I think it's fair to say that we have an economy at the moment, which is uh, lots of people are in employment. There are lots of jobs out there. There just aren't quite enough workers or the right type of workers to fill the right type of post. So to pursue an economic strategy which adds even more jobs to the job market at that time, I feel is counterintuitive if you're applying that as an economic theory to try and boost your economy. because. Actually, your job market is already quite saturated and you've reached your peak. Um, If you want to increase it, as I say, my suggestion would be invest in infrastructure, make sure you're enabling more people to get to work to access those jobs. But that doesn't appear to be the Treasury's plan. So, yeah, that's my that's my very short bit on income tax of why the Conservatives think it's a good idea and why I and other economists think it might be a a short sighted or a misguided view on, on how to drive the economy. We may get into this a bit more with some of the other stuff that's coming up as well, but there are graphs uh, that showed you with the reduction. So basically, you've explained why conservatives think it's fine to give back money to these higher earners because of trickle-down economics, uh, which they say works, although I think the jury is, well, maybe not even out, the jury is very much saying, you know, it hasn't worked before. Um, but the uh, th- th- there is a graph showing, like, you know, the average worker gets back, you know, bearing in mind the average salary in the UK is about 22K, I think, or it might be the average graduate salary. I always get this wrong, so don't quote me on that. But, you know, like, the average salary is a lot lower than any of these thresholds, um, so will only be affected by the, the one penny off uh, the base rate of income tax, which was already announced. It's just been brought forwards. Um, so the average worker is getting back, like, 200 pounds or something like that a year whereas uh for people earning silly money which you know to be fair anyone anyone who'd be hit by the super tax anyway is already on silly money because they're on more than 150k um those people will be getting back thousands a year um which i would make a rather reasonable argument i think that they don't need because Mm -hmm. they're already rich (laughs) um they're, they're like that's the you know and sure there are less people in that pay bracket but that's why you tax them more. And there's a whole load of economic arguments we don't have time to go into here. But yeah, um, I think I think most people think that, well, I would like to say most people think that's a bad move. At least the people I talk to think that's a bad move. We've discussed political bubbles before. But yeah, so let's move on to the next one, talking about giving more money to people who already earn more than enough. Uh, what happened with bankers' bonuses? Yeah, this is a this is a fairly a short point and one that maybe I don't want to dwell on for too long, but I think it's very symbolic of the yeah so the the ideology of the the Conservative government, which is they are going to scrap bankers' bonuses. So previously, under the EU, after the financial crash of two thousand and eight, there was sort of EU regulation around how much could a, a banker could be given as a bonus um, as a as a reward for their job and. Before 2008, people used to say, oh, this is an exorbitant, like, look at look at this banker who's got a million pounds in bonuses where you you suffered or you've they've crashed the markets, but they are still getting loads of money while you are suffering and losing your job, etc. So it was a quite a popular opinion that bankers should have their bonuses capped at an amount to try and keep some degree of equality or fairness or making sure that they weren't the ones benefiting from, you know, shorting the markets or anything like that. The Conservatives have removed that now, which obviously brings up like moral and ethical questions about what's truly fair. Um, is it right for them to yeah, give so much to the bankers overall? Um, but the Conservative point of view on it is that this is a sort of a Brexit dividend. It's one of, you know, if you leave the EU, what are you going to do with this power? Well, we don't have to abide by that rule anymore. Let's scrap it. And it's also a sort of a ploy by the Conservatives, I think, to try and in- attract investment, try to attract banks to settle in the UK to make sure that they can sort of boost the UK growth portfolio in that way. 
Um, it's kind of the thing that we worried about or was one of the things that was said when we left the EU. A very hard Brexit view was that you would scrap EU regulations that were there to protect ordinary people and you could make your our island like the new Singapore, one that very much benefits big business and those massive growth industries to try and attract investment over there. It works very well for one political class, but you do end up with an underclass as a result. Uh, So, yeah, that is, although it is a small matter, it might just be the one that they are testing the water with and seeing, right, how well does this go down? Focus groups, are people willing to accept it? Have we got over bankers now since the 2008 financial crash? My, My suspicion is that it won't go down terribly well in those red wall seats that Boris Johnson won in, in 2019. Um, if they are able to, you know, uh, offset that by shoring up conservative voters in the in the southeast and the southwest, that's that's yet to be seen. But yeah, it's certainly a, a controversial point to move and another another sign that this is a big ideological shift that Liz Truss is putting in. Yeah, it's it's one where I mean, talking about it being unfair, and it's uh, one of those things where I would say the average person on the street would be against it because we remember back to the financial crash and the reason we brought all this stuff in in the first place and the fact that we're on the edge of a recession again uh, and also in a, you know a crisis giving money to people who don't need extra money seems like a bad thing on on the face of it and yeah i i don't know i mean there are i know there are people who vote for the conservatives because they see them as being good for business even if they themselves aren't business owners or bankers but like, you know, the banker vote must be fairly small. They just have a lot of money, which they can throw their weight around with. So it, it it's it's kind of ties into the stuff we said about income tax. I don't really want to belabor the point much more. But yeah, I feel like there's always this claim that allowing like people to get ridiculous bonuses will draw more people over here. And I'm sure it does happen. But also, you know, one of their arguments is, oh, well, this way we'll tempt people to the UK instead of Europe. And it's like, well, if Europe already has those rules you know, everyone has to play by those same rules. The only place to go is like the US or somewhere. But, you know, it's not like banking in the EU has collapsed since these rules came in. People do tend to like to live in the country that they live in. I I don't think it's as big of a factor as they try and sell it as. So um, again, in the tax cuts uh, bonanza, more tax cuts, uh, what happened with business rates? Yeah, so we've talked a bit about like personal finances. This is about business rates. So uh, there was a proposed increase of corporation tax from 19 to 25%. That is cancelled. Um, it will remain at 19%. And that means that we have the lowest rate of corporation tax in the G20. Uh, again, I sort of touched on this earlier when I was talking about personal tax cuts. But the whole idea of this is that, right, businesses have more money. They can reinvest that to create jobs. Um, raise wages is one of the things they said, which surprises me, which because we saw over the summer with big unions striking and demanding that they have wage rises to help with inflation. The government was quite resistant to that, saying, no, 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 we don't want to raise wages because if we raise wages, that will start an inflationary spiral, which will cause you know inflation just to keep going up because we just give you more money and You keep spending it, which means that there's more money in the economy, and that means that prices go up and up and up. The basic um, economics of inflation there, probably incredibly basic, because like I said, I'm not an economist. Um, But that was one of the arguments being banded around. So to see the government saying, yeah, we'll give businesses more money to raise wages seems a little counterproductive to me as well. Like They are saying, oh, no, if it's a public service, we can't possibly pay you more money. But private businesses feel free to raise your wages all you want, which, yeah, seems a little two-faced to me. The other thing they said it was support, because if businesses have more of their money, they can choose where to reinvest it. They also say that private pension funds will be more secure as a result of this, because businesses will have more money to invest in their private pensions. Um, More on how that turned out later. All of this is leading up to a bigger argument, as you say, um, that all of these cuts taken together paint a broader picture as well um that it's going to be a problem but again i think you know sure companies could raise wages uh, and like you said there are other reasons why maybe that's you know you don't want to do that when there's inflation going on and stuff but if if you don't force them to do that i mean ever you know the past shows that companies tend not to people's salaries are generally below where they should be if they had been paid for inflation because you know you have a salary and you stay on that unless you generally either change job which can get you more sal- a higher salary or 
you know, you fight for it. And that's why there's loads of strikes and stuff going on at the moment all over the economy in different uh, sectors, because as the um, energy crisis and everything hits, people are feeling that. And those essential workers and, and other public sector workers need to have an increase in wages to cope with that. There's some other stuff that's been that we'll discuss about, you know, trying to deal with the energy crisis and and so on. But f fundamentally, the point is that companies don't like to pay people more money. The government doesn't like to pay people more money because it looks bad. You know, they'll say, oh, look, we're spending all this much on the NHS paying for all these workers. And generally, staffing is one of the most expensive things. I mean, obviously, there's buying MRI scanners and, and drugs that cost money as well. Um, but if you increase everyone's salary by a percentage, then suddenly your salary bill goes up by a lot when you're talking about thousands and thousands of employees. Um, so yeah, generally, I would say companies don't do that just because you've given them a tax cut. And in fact, in this case, it's not actually a tax cut. It's just keeping the status quo and not taxing them more. And again, just to briefly touch on the argument we had with the banker's salaries, because we're the lowest corporation tax in the G20, no one's going to leave to go to the rest. Of, like, There's always this kind of argument that, oh, if we raise corporation tax, these businesses will just leave. It's like, well, A, a lot of businesses have physical you know buildings or factories and so obviously if it becomes really expensive they will move because it becomes cheaper for them if they can get cheaper labor elsewhere but also if we're at the lowest level of corporation tax we can certainly increase it to a level where we're getting more money from these businesses while not endangering you know while not risking the chance those businesses will go elsewhere because if we're the lowest we know what other comparable countries are doing so that was a bit of waffle <laughs> i feel but yeah, again, I feel like not the best idea. I think we're all okay with it going up, general public, not business owners. But yeah, um, and again, reversing the tax rise will put 19 billion a year back into the economy. Equally, that's 19 billion a year we're not taking in tax to pay for the things we need to pay for. There's a lot of phrasing they do like this and I always flip it the other way around and go, well, that's this much tax we could have spent on the NHS or something else. You know, We've now got kind of a group of various measures under growth and public finances. Can you tell me more about that, Rob? Yeah. So uh, essentially, to, to sum up, um, Kuateng says that my economic plan, I think, will make the economy grow by 2.5% a year. And that's a brilliant idea because it hits, uh, he said, it will in turn end a vicious cycle of stagnation into a virtuous cycle of growth, um, but cautions that none of this is going to happen overnight. So essentially, his point there is that we've been stuck in a a system where you know oh my goodness we need to borrow we haven't got enough money right we'll we'll raise taxes to fund that borrowing and the conservative mindset is that when you keep raising taxes if you raise them too much you tax businesses out of being competitive and you end up in a vicious cycle where you just have to keep on increasing tax and we need to break them. so that's his proposal and that's why some conservatives would say yes that's an excellent idea i've worried that there is too much Treasury group think that the you know that the Treasury for the past since the 2008 financial crash has been far too cautious about this stuff. We've had a very set mindset. We need to break out of that, and that's what I'm here to do. Um, however, uh, as you mentioned at the start, the Office of Budget Responsibility usually publishes a report with every mini budget saying yes, and the Chancellor has said that, and here are the figures to back that up. Uh, unfortunately. They didn't publish any of that with this budget. They say that that report will come out sometime in November. So the Chancellor is basically saying, trust me, it'll work. Where are your workings? Uh, uh, you know, uh, they're steamed clams. I don't know. He's riffing, right? He really is riffing at this point. So, yeah, that's not, that's not great. If I was a businessman and somebody was unable to produce their figures, I don't think that would get you passed on Dragon's Den, never mind being the, the chance of the Exchequer. Um, on top of this, the final big point, and this is the one that Liz Truss will stress to the hilt, and it's the one that she's been talking about in interviews all day, is that we've had an energy crisis running on in the background, right? Over the summer, when we said, oh, it's good that Boris Johnson can't do very much to damage the economy, he also wasn't doing very much to save it either. And we saw the threat of rising energy costs as a direct result of the war in Ukraine and gas prices going up as there is a shortage of gas, energy prices increasing to a massive level. So the government decided to step in, not by taxing the energy companies and doing a windfall tax, as was proposed by Labour, but instead the government will essentially 
pay the energy companies the difference of how much we're going to be charged for their gas. And that comes at a cost of 60 billion for the taxpayer, and that will cover the next six months. So you've got in total, just to sum up this plan as it is, you've got loads of tax cuts on one side, you've got an extra 60 billion of spending coming just from one policy in energy, and you have no cuts to public services, right? There's no cuts in the public purse. So when they say this is a huge gamble and why you know, it, it's quite uncertain what's going to happen. You are betting everything that you can grow your economy by 2.5% to make up that deficit, right? If you're balancing any budget, you're saying, right, if, if, if you were running a business day to day, you say, right, I've got to sell this much because if I don't sell this much, if I'm not prepared to cut back on what I'm buying or choose a cheaper supplier or do anything like that, I have to sell more things in order for my business to be successful. And that's the risk they're running with the economy. Now, they might have been able to, you know, if they were able to produce OBR figures that say, yeah, this is really likely, actually, they might have been able to reassure the markets a little bit more. However, when the, when the message from the Chancellor is just, yeah, trust us, we'll grow, and there are worries that we might go into a recession in the next quarter, that's when the markets get very spooked. And they start to believe that, hey, ho, do I want to invest in the UK? Is this country going to be able to pay its debts or is it going to default? And that's one of the big no-nos for your country. You always want to be able to pay your debts. So that's where we got with the markets on Friday. I think since then, on Monday and Tuesday, we get start to see some other effects. Yeah, I'm just going to put in the chat the uh, lovely uh, graph of the pound versus the US dollar. Just dropping people say it's a gamble uh not backed up with facts and figures like you know if i could believe that sentence you read out about getting rid of a vicious cycle of stagnation and going into this virtuous circle of great i'd love that like if if someone who knows their numbers says that to me and i can believe it well that sounds great right i should invest in this country um however as you laid out uh, it didn't quite go that way so uh the markets uh well i mean i've put in the chat a a graph of the pound versus the dollar the, the pound started to drop during the mini budget. So it starts going down. So what, what really starts happening, because as you say, like we're on the edge of a recession probably. So therefore we're not going to grow two and a half percent, one would assume, because that seems to be quite fanciful. Uh, I don't think his changes, you know, he, he says his changes will do this, but where's the working, <laughs> as we've just said. So uh, what, what does that cause the markets to do? I mean, other than start dropping the value of the pound, but uh, why does the pound drop? So the, the pound drops because you would keep your money in sterling if you felt the British economy was going to do well and that currency is going to stay strong and have power over you know, like have a good spending value against the rest of the world. People start to not believe that because of the budget. So people say, right, I'm going to take my money out of the pound and put it into the US dollar. That's far more reliable. So all of a sudden you start to see the value of the pound go down against the US dollar, which is at some point it had didn't quite gain parity, but certainly you're getting to the point where nearly it's one dollar equals one pound. Now, you might shrug your shoulders and go, okay, my exchange rate's a little bit different, but it has huge effects on the way that you buy and sell your goods internationally. So for example, a a weak pound is good for exports because it means the US dollar is stronger against the pound. So your people with US dollars can buy more British things. Okay, excellent. But for your imports, it has the inverse effect. If I'm buying stuff in dollars, it takes more of my British pounds to import that item. And we're importing a lot, including at this time of year, food. We're about to enter winter. Um, There are things that we can't simply provide for ourselves. Food on supermarkets starts going up a little bit more. What does that impact on? Inflation, because all of a sudden the prices of goods are going up. Your wage packet doesn't go as far when you go to the supermarket creates a crisis for lots of households. The other thing it affects, fuel. All oil is bought in dollars. That's just the standard. So if we are importing our fuel from America or anywhere else, and our pounds don't stretch as far when we're buying it by oil by the barrel, that increases fuel prices as a result. What are we trying to control? Fuel prices and making sure it doesn't go up. 
is that will contribute to inflation as well. So, yeah, the government in trying to do an act which they said, yeah, it's going to, yeah, we, we think this is inflationary control because we're going to have growth rather than stagnation. In fact, in the short term, at least, they are making this problem worse. And there is only one way, or there's one sort of standard way that you can help control inflation, and that is by raising your interest rate. But this also has another knock on effect. So it is interest rates are controlled by the Bank of England. The Bank of England is entirely an independent organisation to the government. Um, It's been set up that way for a while now, basically to ensure that, well, in, in circumstances like we have now, if you have a government that has quite a risky fiscal proposal, the Bank of England can always step in to put the brakes on something or stop them from entirely crashing the economy. So um, one of the ways that they're trying to reduce inflation is they've said a proposed raise in interest rates, which basically means uh, we're encouraging people to save their money. So if you get 1% on every pound that you keep in the bank, that's better than the 0.5% we were on. Uh, However, interest rates also affect borrowing. And one of the biggest things people borrow is money for your house or your mortgages. You've got an economy where it's got inflation on the one side. The Bank of England steps in and says, no, I'm going to have to try and raise interest rates to stop that inflation. But in turn, that will raise people's mortgage rates by quite a bit. And when I say quite a bit, it doesn't take much of a percentage rise to have a huge impact because people will have been the people who are not on fixed term mortgages, who are on trackers that track the interest rates. Interest rates have been historically low for a very, very long time. If it ticks up by 0.5%, but from 0.5 to 1%, all of a sudden your mortgage costs far, far more the next month, like to a point where you're like, oh my goodness, I'm not sure I can afford the mortgage next month. I'm not sure I can keep my house, which clearly is going to be quite an unpopular policy amongst a, a large proportion of house owners who are house owners. They're not even the poorest in the society. The poorest in society are usually renting at the moment who are affecting middle Englanders who tend to be those who vote Conservative. So not only is this a big shock to the economy, it's also the Conservatives shooting themselves in the foot somewhat. And I know you you mentioned at the start that like you are in the housing market at the moment. You are looking to buy. It was reported this morning that was it over 300 types of mortgages had to be pulled from banks because they say, oh, that's just not fiscally viable anymore. You've wiped out all of these because the interest rates have had to go up to try and stop the economic damage that's been put in place by this mini budget. So yeah, it's it's having a huge impact and that yeah wasn't even the only thing. I can give some some relevant numbers here because I have asked this question of a mortgage advisor recently because as as you said we were looking to try and buy somewhere there were some issues with that it fell through but that means we have a mortgage offer that's still valid for a period of time. Now that means our rate is actually locked into May this year which right now if we could find somewhere that we could move into quickly, would be amazing. Um, I'm not going to go into too many details here, but like to put it in context, if that offer falls through and we were to get to loan the same amount of money, a mortgage is a big loan, then we would be paying per month £500 more, roughly. That is some people's rent. Um, (laughs) Like that, that's, you know, that, that's the level that's like, that is that, I mean, that would put paid to any chances of us buying property anytime soon. Um, but at least we're in the position where, I mean, there's a lot of things going on here. Obviously, at some point, rents will go up if the people who are renting also have a mortgage and don't own the property outright. Uh, so it could you know, get us in a year or so. And so a lot of these things don't necessarily hit you immediately. Um, but yeah, so we're, the, the, the deal we have is on a fixed rate mortgage for five years, which hopefully would see us through all this current amount of problem. Yeah, that, that kind of change in price is what you're looking at. And then there are people who are on variable mortgages, you know, I've spoken to some people who went onto a variable mortgage like 12 years ago because the interest rates were so low. And, uh, you know, their repayments on their mortgage have gone up massively, even more so than that £500 figure. Um, And if you don't have any savings or whatever, then you might default on your mortgage payment. And if you default on your mortgage payments, you lose your house. Um, And what starts happening then is the house prices start dropping. And then the economy, you know, the economy like kind of assumes that house prices are going to go up. um, And there's a whole load of stuff. And then we're back to 2007 and, and the Great Recession, where that's essentially what happened in America for, for different reasons. But suddenly loads of people 
who had been given mortgages they they could afford suddenly couldn't afford their mortgages anymore. So everyone starts defaulting on their mortgages, and and you get into a situation where the housing market collapses. So it's that level of serious again. Um, I would say. I mean, we're not quite there, but that's that's the kind of problem we could have. It's it's scary, and it, the, the weird thing is, is that wasn't the least of the government's issues yesterday. So one of the big factors that happened yesterday, which I don't fully understand, if I'm honest, but I know the gist of it, and I have put in a BBC article and Robert Peston, who I was following a lot yesterday, who understands these things a lot more. But essentially, um, there are things called bonds that the UK has. Bond is a fancy word for sort of like loan. If you go to the bank, you loan all that money from one bank. Bonds are where multiple investors can sort of say, we'll lend the money to this country, but there's lots of us and we will include it in this single bond. And these are traded on the financial market because, of course, they are. You can trade anything and people will try and sort of bet on when the bonds go up and when the bonds go down. And it's essentially the cost that the UK will have to repay that money back. Um, if if the economy feels that your the, the UK is unable to pay its loans back, the cost of those bonds go up and up and up, and that's yeah, that's bad because you're seen as somebody who can't be relied to pay back your debt. Essentially, so you have to pay high interest. These markets, um, a lot of pension funds, private pension funds, bet against them, and they sort of like have money invested. In. And what was happening over the course of yesterday is the cost of those was crashing. The one Peston one I saw said that at the start of the year, um, it was worth sort of like 80 pence per bond or whatever it was. And it crashed to around about 25 pence yesterday because the markets were losing that much confidence that we'd be able to pay them back. Now, what happened was the Bank of England stepped in and basically in a, a fit of quantitative easing where Positive easing is the point that the, the Bank of England sort of like just prints more money to pay for things. The Bank of England said, don't worry, we'll buy our own debt, which in itself is confusing for me. But this action essentially stopped that from dipping any further. And it went back up to around about 34 pence. That's a lot of numbers I've thrown at you. And to be honest, I myself am still confused by the situation. But the underlying figure that Robert Peston pointed out and other news sources pointed out was that if the Bank of England had not stepped in, it was a very real danger that a large percentage of the UK pensions market would have collapsed yesterday, which is catastrophic, essentially. And to the point where Robert Peston was saying um, it would have mean that, that companies would have had to have made redundancies yesterday afternoon, like instantly, like we just can't afford to keep people, this is bad. You're talking Northern Rock scale 2008 financial crash terms located entirely within our country. So one, it's very good that the Bank of England stepped in to stop that. But also, why have we got an economic policy that, you know, this is quite clearly the fault of this mini budget on Friday that went ahead. You know, the Bank of England has this power, this ability to step in and do this, to And it's designed to deal with external shocks, which are not the fault of our own government making stupid decisions to the detriment of the majority of the population. I think that sums up quite well, even though it sounds a bit angry. I mean, I think we have a right to be a bit angry about this. But um, yeah, I mean, that's that's it, really. Yes, you get to the point where the markets are crashing. They're in turmoil. Everybody's going, where's Liz Truss? Where is Kwasi Kwarteng? Why haven't they not issued a response on this? So yesterday afternoon, uh, Kwarteng comes out and there's a leak from the government that basically says, oh, we're asking departments to see where they could make efficiency savings. Essentially, they say, ah, we realise we might have to cut something because we're not going, this growth is not going to be able to cover our spending, so we'll need to cut something. That might shore up the markets a little bit. Also, she's done a round of local news interviews this morning, which is part of the Conservative Party conference season, which starts next week. Um, Apparently, all the party leaders do it. They have select slots on BBC local radio where they answer, you know, queries from not only local radio DJs, but they get people to submit their own questions and they have to answer them. And it's sort of like a run up to the party conference season saying, aren't we in touch with the common person? Uh, Liz Truss went on hers and just got bombarded with questions saying, why have you done this? Why have you crashed your own economy? And her response was, 
This is a global crisis caused by Vladimir Putin. I've done excellent stuff for energy. I know this policy is unpopular, but trust me, it will work out in the end. So from an internal conservative point of view, it seems that they are determined to follow this course of action. Now, the question remains if the faith will hold um, within the Conservative Party, because as we'll go on when we discuss in the polls, it doesn't look like the general public have taken this economic policy well at all. But there are now rumblings within the Conservative Party that, yeah, they feel that this mini budget might be the one that gets them out of power and actually is the one that sort of dooms the Conservatives to years in the wilderness. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you've got anything to add about like the stories you've heard internally on the on the uh, internally implying i'm in fact a member of the conservative <laughs> well, party which i'm very yeah, yeah, much yeah, not sorry um, no, yes no sorry we, we we had we had some information didn't we and there have been leaked stories about the state of the party conference. Yeah, uh, yeah. W- yeah i mean we have heard uh some rumors um i always am a bit loath to talk without without the permission of the people who've passed on rumors but um I mean, I obviously won't mention any names. I, I think that the takeaway bit was that that someone involved, if someone wanted to be like involved uh, heavily in in the Tory Party conference, which is next week, that they would be seen to be a a spokesperson for the current government, which may not be here in the next few weeks, uh, which is uh, strong. Um, like I, I know we talked about some Boris fans putting in um, votes of no confidence against uh, Liz Truss. Um, potentially, like, you know, people have said they might have done such a thing on Twitter, but the fact that this was so bad that, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, the Conservative Party is quite a broad right-wing church at the moment. Like, you you have people who are, you know, weren't fans of Brexit and stuff like that, but, I mean, they've kind of gone like, we've had Brexit, we've got over that, and blah, blah, blah. But this is yet another self-imposed problem uh, that people are going, well, why have we done this? This is obviously stupid, and obviously, yeah, (laughs) there's a lot of, there's been a lot of, like, you know, uh, Tory MPs going up and just saying this is ridiculous. Why are we doing this? This isn't what we voted for. So, the best one I've heard is Rishi Sunak saying that he won't be attending the party conference because he wants Liz Truss to um, have her moment, which is like extreme shade from uh, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, who in a there's there's basically an article in the Spectator published about two weeks ago. Or just on the eve of the of the results being released for the Conservative Party leadership race, where Rishi Sunak said, if Liz Truss is allowed to go ahead with her policy, she will crash the pound and we will see market turmoil. And the spectator dismissed this as doom mongering. Um, the fact that he's like the um, have you seen the Simpsons episode where Homer becomes the garbage collector? <laughs> yes, guy? yes. Uh, the Rishi garbage Sunak man is, can. Yes, Rishi Sazak is the Roy Patterson of that situation where it's like, I told you this wouldn't work. You're all going to crash and burn now. I'm done with you. Bye. That's what Rishi Sunak is doing now. And the fact that we are talking about this turmoil within the Conservative Party for a new leader who has lasted all of 22 days, about 14 of those within a national mourning period where she literally couldn't do anything. It's astounding that this has gone um, so badly, so quickly. So, yes, who can say what it's going to do for the future of Liz Truss and the future of the Conservative Party? Uh, but maybe a quick look at the polls can give us a slight inkling into what the uh, the general public thinks. So I think we're going to just quickly look at uh, the polls, as you say. So uh, the I'm going to first look at Politico's poll of polls, which is our, you know, our sensible view on this. So it's um, this is a rolling average uh so there's a bit of a spike uh, for Labour uh, in the last few days. So Labour's currently in a lead, according to that, of 46%, which I'm just going to see what the maximum view I can have is. Uh, back to 2014, Labour have never been this high. Obviously, there were times when Labour was in power where presumably they were higher, but on this, the maximum chart that's shown here with Cowan smoothing, uh, 46% is the highest Labour have been in eight years uh the conservatives have dropped to 29 percent, which isn't their lowest their lowest point being 20 percent around brexit when obviously the reform party stole a load of brexiteers briefly from from the conservatives the lib dem is kind of floating around their normal kind of 10 percent position uh, and everyone else is kind of where you'd expect them to be so basically people going from voting conservative to voting labor i saw a raft of statistics going past today for various things but that you know in general terms labor doing well um, I think we need to talk about that last poll, which maybe 
in in this rolling average, obviously it's an average, so that it brings up a bit, but it hasn't completely uh, completely um, uh, thrown it off 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 balance. This uh, most recent YouGov poll is only over the last two days. I don't actually know the sample size. I did try to find that out before we uh, recorded, um, but I can't seem to find it on YouGov's page. But presumably the normal amount of people they poll um and it showed labor at 54 percent which would be the highest since i believe 1930 um the conservatives down at 21 percent, which would put them down to their the doldrums of brexit when they were you know fighting with reform lib dem has dropped a bit i guess people just going we need to get labor in to to stop the conservatives which which is kind of a, a normal effect we see when when it's the possibility of a, a general election yeah it's uh 33 points ahead that's a massive lead and there's a few numbers going around so i i'm gonna just be clear here so that because some of this people may have seen reported on twitter without the explanation so there is a based on those numbers we could then predict what the national average would be uh if we if we took those percentages and sent them over the country how does that affect things this is the thing people like to do the election maps UK do a predicted map what the uh, YouGov poll would look like if we had a general election today based on that. So Labour would gain 296 seats. The Conservatives would lose 304 seats. That would give Labour a majority with 498, Conservatives have 61, and the SNP would have 36, Lib Dems 29, which is a boost for the Lib Dems actually, despite the fact that their percentage is lower. Um, but yeah, a Labour majority of 346, basically meaning Labour could do what they wanted for a period of time. But then that would be if it happened today. Of course, we're not due to have a general election just yet. So we are stuck with the Tories Torying about uh, and messing things up for a bit. Um, but uh, something I don't think we've necessarily touched on much in this podcast and would get to when it happens is they're redrawing the boundaries, uh, which is a bit like in the US when they talk about gerrymandering and stuff. You know, they they get a load of people to decide where should we draw the line for each constituency, and because of first past the post and how our system works, that can affect the numbers somewhat. So someone ran the numbers with the new boundaries that come into effect in 2023 taken into account, and under that system, the Conservatives would lose 376 seats, leaving them on two seats. <laughs> which I think might be unprecedented. Um, I know that's a word we don't like to throw around much. But, um, <laughs> unprecedented. Um, that would be literally unprecedented. It would leave Labour with um, a, a increase of 376 seats, basically like for like, giving them predicted 571 seats, which is would hilariously make the SNP with their 51 predicted seats, which is slightly more than they have now, the official opposition party. Um, and the Conservatives would have less uh, less seats than the Lib Dems. Um, one more than the Greens, because the Greens only ever have one seat, uh, it would seem. So, yeah, that is, I, I mean, it's a prediction. Obviously, <laughs> it would have to happen today. But with the 2023, there's a whole load of stuff going on and it probably won't be this bad. And, you know, as you get near a general election, you might find that people. But, you know, this is this is Tony Blair winning in 1997 with a giant majority levels of, of you know, I mean, it's more than that. Um, although I don't think these exact numbers will actually play out in real life. Um, although it'd be hilarious if they did. It's absolutely wild. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think finally we found something that breaks that kind of conservative stranglehold. I mean, I know Labour have been in the lead since like the start of 2022. And we've kind of talked a bit about how, you know, the UV invasion of Ukraine and stuff has affected things. But it very much seems like now it is Labour are in the lead until we have a general election, which will probably be 2024, I believe, under the the normal rules uh, of general elections. There's no way they're going to want to call one early with these numbers. Yes. Well, it's almost, I always like to refer to politi my political history and compare it with events in the past. If you look at like the major government that ran from 92 to 97, that was characterised by sleaze. And you could say that's almost like the Boris Johnson era. That's a slow leaking of support who basically people say, oh, I think this Tory government's been in charge for quite a while now. And it's looking a bit corrupt, essentially. Um, so that started to leak them some votes and they lost by elections in their in their droves. Then what happened was Black Monday, which was their attempt to join um, the European currency or try and put it on parity with some European currency. The market rejected it. It failed. And a lot of people suddenly went, oh, my goodness me, the Conservatives can't run the economy. And it's that old phrase of it's the economy, stupid. If you can't 
if you crash your economy, you're going to lose a lot of votes because that is the thing that affects absolutely everybody. And we've had those two things happen in recent memory. It's between two different prime ministers. We've had sleaze under Boris and a crashing of the economy under Liz Truss, as it would appear, even though the markets have stabilised a little bit now. Um, there's still a lot of factors there where people say you are running this a bit close or you better change your tactics soon or you run a real risk to the economy. So Yes, those are the sort of things that will cause a landslide to go against you and Labour. We we will talk about it next time because I think next time we'll focus on party conferences more. Alongside all this, in the shadow of this economic turmoil, Labour have been having their party conference season. And boy, does the atmosphere feel very different around the Labour Party now. As in, before it was a party sort of divided, one that was clearly fighting Boris Johnson. But as we've said it, Keir Starmer's vision appeared to be one of, I'm not Boris Johnson, so vote for me if you don't like Boris. This party conference, for me, was one where they believed they could win, that they were the next party of government and produced some policies, which we will go into more detail next time, but they were very concrete, costed policies, the exact opposite of what the current Conservative government is offering right now. So, yeah, it's early days. There's a lot of time between the next election and that prediction of two Conservative MPs is not going to happen. I will, I will guarantee that now. If it does, I will, I will eat a hat. I know that that's a Paddy Ashdown was forced to eat a hat, so um, I may have my Paddy Ashdown moment. But if I do, it'll be the. I, t- I try not to be biased. You'll be you washing it down with champ. Want... You'll be washing it down yes. with champagne. Yeah, <laughs> yeah basically, it'll be the happiest hat I've ever eaten. So. Yes, um, that's it. Really interesting time. Significant moves in the polls. And uh, yeah, it will be interesting to see if Labour can maintain that lead the next time we do that podcast or if the Conservatives are able to recover some ground. Because to be honest, I can't see how it can get any worse than that that YouGov polled. No, and I mean, as I say, it's a single poll. (laughs) It's fun because of the map and how ridiculous this all looks. But again, it's a single poll. The average is nowhere near that although it's still in Labour's favour, and if this is maintained, I mean, at the very least, you can see why the Conservatives would want to get rid of Liz Truss as soon as possible if those are the figures that we're getting, and also, as we've mentioned, the economy. So, like, if if you are a backbencher Conservative right now, you are plotting it's the Night of the Long Knives all over again. It's only been, like, three months. Um, so, yeah, they'll be plotting again to get rid of her, to replace her with someone else. Again, not wanting to make predictions, but, like... I, I don't see how she can survive this, really. It's it's that bad. Um and and so quickly as well. I think, you know, she just doesn't have the time to kind of I, I don't know what she could do to bring it back, you know. And she um, has to reverse the she has to reverse her decision. She has to say, I've got it wrong. But at the moment that seems to be something that they are unwilling or unable to do. She's currently doing the uh the Boris, oh no, you know, sending everyone out and saying, Yes, this was definitely correct. Uh, move which we know didn't work well for Boris uh, and it's that same kind of you know people wanted Boris gone because he'd gone too far feels like she's in a different way hit the same point already so insert Senator Palpatine ironic meme <laughs> yes yeah I don't, I don't have much more to say really uh, it's been a wild time it's been good to uh, catch up um, and I'm glad we had a chance to talk this through it's been a long episode it's, it's, it's a bumper edition to get us back into season six. This is episode 601 because we number hours weirdly a bit like um, the Bugle does. Thank you, as always, for joining us. I hope you've stuck with us to the end. It was a long one, a bumper edition. Uh, normally our episodes are a bit shorter than this, but there was a lot of news to get through and we had to kind of touch on all of it because it's been a very busy three or four weeks. And uh, we will see you next time, as Rob says, to discuss uh, conference season. Labour conference has already happened. The Conservative one is about to happen. And I can only imagine that the headlines out of that will be interesting, um, given what we have heard. Uh, So we will see you for that next time. Uh, If you want to support us, you can go to patreon.com forward slash TTSS, where you can become a patron for a mere $1 a month. Although I appreciate that's more of an ask now with the value of the pound. Um, But you, yeah, for $1 a month, you can become a patron and you will get access to a bonus feed with uh, all sorts of extra stuff from the various podcasts we have. Rob and I always have a bit of a chat as we're running into the episode where we just kind of discuss what's going on in our lives and, you know, have we seen each other recently, that kind of stuff. If that interests you, that's there in that feed. Uh, tend to do an outtake episode at the end of each season, which I need to upload for season five. Uh, I just haven't got around to it yet, but there'll be one of those. 
and also for our other podcasts as and when I, I think Astrocast should be coming back soon I'm saying that here to force Brad to do it um <laughs> and uh yeah there, there'll be other podcasts will be coming back online at various points and we'll have their various bonus episodes as well um all there for a mere one dollar a month even if that is you know about 10 percent more expensive than it was last week um <laughs> and uh if you don't want to be a patron you can always go and uh, like and share the podcast tell people about us you can find us online at reddit.com forward slash r forward slash unparliamentary you can find us on twitter and instagram at unpal podcast and you can find us on facebook as just unparliamentary language uh, where you will get you know updates about the show uh us sharing our various episodes all of that jazz uh like and subscribe essentially i haven't done this intro in a while it sounds a bit weird but i think uh there's not much more else left for me to say other than it's good night from me Oh, it's good night from here. Bye. 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 Can only get better. They can only get better now. Now, now, things can only get. They can only get. Bum, 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 Join Mike and Tom. For a nerdy conversation with a multitude of guests on the Hat of Many Things. Say hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hello. I'm Mark, a librarian and professional wrestling ring announcer. And I cast League of Legends. I'm Sadaros Phil Brucato, best known for my work with uh, White Wolf and uh, Onyx Path Publishing on the World of Darkness. Uh, hi, I'm Jason Carl. I'm uh, the producer of V5 at uh, White Wolf. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Johanna Pettersson, a Finnish game, game designer. Thank <laughs> you.